In the year 736 BC, in the period known as the Golden Age of Mercury, a young herder called Tamerius the Dyspeptic crossed the Dregflow River from his native Tubidia into Humeria, known today as Polish Tuscany, seeking pasture lands for his herd of ravenous peccaries. When he emerged onto the opposite muddy bank, he saw a stone wall looming in the distance. In fact, on top of the wall, he saw a man operating a loom, but he took little interest in it. Tamerius climbed to the top of the wall, wiped the mud from his eyes, and beheld, beyond the loom, a miraculous abandoned city on a hill in ruins. Crumbling stone towers were remnants of great architecture and fallen arches revealed the inadequate podiatry of the era. It would be centuries before custom insoles were invented. It was a vast metropolis, bigger than anything that Tamerius had ever seen in Tobidia, at the time the 27th largest state in the known world. But this abandoned Humerian city was opulent and technologically advanced. The ample streets were lined with bronze machines that seemed to have produced donuts and crullers of enormous size. All of the edifices were grand, multi-story palaces adorned with pyramid-like emblems emblazoned with the image of delicate feet, with corns of semi-precious stones. Even the peccaries were impressed. <laughs> Tamerius quizzed those who lived on the outskirts of this abandoned city, and with his rudimentary knowledge of the Humerian language, discovered that the current population had little idea who built the city and why it had been abandoned. They were also not fond of peccaries. Tamerius was tarred and feathered. Later in life, Tamerius became a scribe and wrote an account of his discovery. I approached one wizened old man who threw a potato at me. He spoke of enormous worm farms near the river where I could obtain fresh dumplings if I were hungry. When I asked him what had happened to the Humerians of antiquity, he asked me if I wanted to buy his nephew's pet weasel. His ignorance of the ruins was astounding. To us, the Humerian Empire might seem like a relic a distant, dusky, icky pile of crud festering in the hot desert sun, filled with scorpions and half-eaten pita wraps. But to the people who lived there, it was that, and much more. A thriving, vibrant metropolis, with horrific sewage problems, rampant square dancing, and leering, sweaty policemen in grimy tunics. But how had this great civilization begun? How had it grown out of the dry, dusty, putrid, roach-infested plain, where even Tamerius's peccaries could barely survive? And how did it disappear from the face of the earth, like so many Cheetos at a frat party? Pass me the ball, please. In this series, A Fowl of Civilizations, we will examine how great societies sprang up like noxious weeds, flourished, went to seed, and disappeared in the sawdust of oblivion, the coffee grounds of humanity, the detritus of a carnival barker's last weekend in Las Vegas. Tamerius, as he ascended the Humerian hill on which the city was situated, could make out through the foggy haze the outlines of a mysterious stone statue in a vast square. It was a depiction of a noble warrior in a grand helmet with a shining brass sword and a tiny card piece. From the pictographs inscribed on its pedestal, Later historians would divine that this was the founder of the staggeringly ornate city, Horko Lazuli. Images of the great Horko are ubiquitous in these ruins. 
The residents of this city could not escape the fierce gaze of this formidable general, statesman, and cabbage vendor, except in laundromats. Only laundromats were devoid of his image, perhaps due to the reverence with which Humerians regarded well-washed and pressed clothing. The name of this city to this day is disputed. The heated arguments it has engendered among Oxbridge historians have resulted in several fatal stabbings and clubbings of one another, and rightly so. This shining city on a hill was called either Rich Publis, or, as is more generally believed by the survivors of these academic altercations, Weed Patch. Regardless of its name, the driving force behind the establishment of this magnificent Humerian city-state was Horko Lazuli, or, as history remembers him, Horko the Grating. Born into squalid poverty, we'll henceforth refer to it as Squavity. Horko's father was a cabbage vendor on the second lowest rung of the social order. Strong and petulant from infancy, Horko was renowned for strangling a musk ox at the tender age of 14 months. Songs and poems of the era recount that he could throw a head of cabbage 40 meters with deadly accuracy. In a display of prodigious leadership skills, he organized over three dozen four-year-olds to attack, loot, and destroy the local leper colony. The spoils included gold, anthracite, and leper pornography on stone tablets. As Horko grew, so did his ambitions. Dr. Wilhelm Bromiliad, Cambridge professor of ancient history and author of Horko, You Betcha, tells of his great rise. He had heard a lot about conquests of distant lands and began to envision himself as one destined for great deeds. When the ruler of the fiefdom died of a toenail fungus infection, he petitioned the new fief, Fofum V, for a military command promising to bring great glory and fresh cabbage to the tribes of Humeria. After discussing the relative virtues of green cabbage, typhoon cabbage, and bilco cabbage for a period of 13 days, Fofum granted Horko command of 12 cavalrymen, 30 foot soldiers, 27 archers, and an octogenarian with a slingshot. Horko instilled enormous esprit de corps in his troops by treating them to feasts of crab cakes and lemon meringue pies followed by lascivious squareds. They enthusiastically marched on neighboring Murkia after brutally defeating the Murkian soldiers, raising the great Murkian library, and decapitating their elders with large butter knives. Porco installed his trusty lieutenant, Glaucomus, as ruler to exact tribute and regulate the cabbage trade. Porco returned to the palace of Fofum a celebrated warrior. He and his men were carried by a crowd down the streets of their city and dumped into a pit of angry alligators as was the custom. The survivors were revered for the glory they had brought to the growing, ambitious city of Rich Pudlis. It was not Rich Pudlis, it was Weed Patch. It was Rich Pudlis, and you know it, you moist towelette. You, sir, are a creeping spurge. I will run you through with this fountain pen. You'll run me? Hey! <laughs> Hawke's successful campaign prompted an enthusiastic fofum to make a grand proclamation. Horko would assume the command of the fiefdom's entire armed forces. Horko accepted graciously and instantly ordered his new men to kill Fofum. They did so. Horko was now fief. But this fiefdom would not be enough for the ambitious Horko, as we will discover after the break. This podcast is dependent on your support for its survival. Please visit Putreon, our host, find our podcast, and donate $10,337 or a 1973 Dodge Dart with a 225 cubic inch engine to continue listening. These meager contributions allow me to spend more time researching, writing, practicing yo-yo tricks, lounging on my inner tube in the Caribbean, and traveling by moped to the Fromage Ranch in Nevada. 
It also gives me the opportunity to rub elbows with the likes of Elon Musk and famous contortionist and statesman Coco Drizzle. This podcast has been suspended for over pursuit of filthy lucre. Podcasts on this side are required to adhere to strict rules regarding... Hello? How much? Cash, check, Venmo. Ah. We now continue with this podcast, A Foul of Civilizations Still in Progress. Among the guests at the palace was Molluscus, the king of Magnesia. He was impressed by the music at Holko's court. This was the period where iconic classical Humerian music was developed. It's playing in the background now, as interpreted by the renowned classical musician Reggio Carmageddon. But I'm not going to bring the volume up full and let you hear it, because I prefer the sound of my own voice droning on droning, and on, on, or the words on. that I have written, droning, read by actors of questionable read by personal hygiene, questionable droning, personal droning, personal droning, on, and droning on and on. We'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast, but we can't. Recent legislation in The Hague has mandated that we can only acknowledge your listenership or express mild nausea. We will keep you apprised of future international legislation. We can, however, thank the imitable, repressible John Martin House for his portrayal of the illustrious Wilhelm Bromeliad. We submit for your consideration one Mark Baldwin, who wrote, produced, scored, and edited the whole damned thing. So blame it on him. A Foul of Civilizations is a copyrighted production of Baldwin Filmworks, Inc. Purveyors of fine mirth and coarse discourse, scouring the globe to find the most excruciatingly serious... Hey, enough of that. Bring in the bulldozers. Yeah.